Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 145 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. How's it going, partner? Well, we're into 2021 and so far, pretty good. All right. (laughs) How about yourself? I'm doing good. We're recording this right before the new year and I'm about wrapped up with the whole Christmas season and I'm tired. I'm tired of working, but I'm almost through it. Yeah, it's been a crazy end of the year, but I'm so glad that we can start afresh, as they say. yep Let's do this. I've taken on the task of making 2021. I'm going to try to take our laboratory paperless. Nice. So I have a question for you. Do you guys keep old RXs or do you scan them in? Uh, We keep them still. Do you? Yeah, that's what I need to figure out because I got the scanning down, but do I keep them? Do I shred them? I, I don't know what to do. I really don't want them. I have years upon years upon years of paperwork and I just want that out of my life. So you know who to call, right? Ghostbusters? I knew you were going to say that. I'm Ethan, <laughs> Bennett, NADL. They got you got yeah. some, some big powerhouse help over there, so give them a call. Find out. So you think it's more of a legal issue rather than a just a clutter issue? Yeah, I think it's a legal issue. I, I think, I don't know, it used to be five years, but once you scan them, you have them. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I think once you scan them, you can do away with the paper, but you still have to keep them for an amount of time. I think it's five years. Yeah, I mean, once you scan it in, you keep it forever. It's just data. Yeah. I mean, it's not taking up any room. I'm just tired of the paperwork. I'm pretty sure once you scan it, you can chuck it, but don't quote me on that. I'm thinking monthly bonfires in the back might be good. Yeah, (laughs) don't breathe. As this year starts off, we want to make 2021 even better, and we want to hear more from you. So what guests do you want us to reach out to? What topics do you want Barb and I to cover? Do you yourself have a great story or technique you want to share? Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or send us a message on Facebook or Instagram. It's super easy to connect with us and we would love to have more of you on the podcast. This week we are joined by Tim Bertram, a name that is closely associated with metal frameworks and flexible partials. Why most labs try to do as much as they can in-house, many will outsource these two restorations because it's hard to find the talented technicians to do them. Do you guys do fray works at night? Nope, not anymore. Nope, there you go. Nope. I tell you, I got one guy hanging on to these things. <laughs> and our flexibles we send out. We yeah, just same here. don't have the people. Yeah, okay, so a lot of people do it. So if you're going to send them to another lab... We suggest sending them to one that is here in the U.S. and have been doing it since 1976. Awesome. Bertram Dental Lab up in Wisconsin seems to have found and trained the people to specialize in the much-needed metal frameworks and flexibles to service other labs. While they still do them traditionally with waxing and casting, they also run a really nice digital workflow by printing SLL frames, flexibles, and even surgical guides submitted from a lab's design software. So join us as we learn all about the past, present, and future of RPDs with Tim Bertram. Hey, Barbara, have you heard about Oradent and their new partnership? You mean up? 3D, Elvis? Exactly. The new P5 milling machine by Up3D. Is it another private label milling machine on the market? Actually, no. That's the cool thing. Up3D actually manufactures their own mills. Wow, that's awesome. What is the P5 milling machine offering? Well, for starter, the P5 is a 5-axis efficient dry mill. All right, so that's super ideal and totally convenient, but what about the quality of the milling? Well, it boasts software that produces high precision and fast milling. It can mill a crown, get this, in 14 minutes. And the tool life yields about 60 to 80 hours of quality restorations. Wow, that must be super expensive software, do tell. The cam nasting software is included at no additional cost. Come on, that's a super great cost savings for any lab. Budget friendly without compromising any of the performance. All right, so let's talk about price. Well, the funny thing is it retails for only 
$18,000. Wow, that's a super game changer for labs of all sizes, big and small. Under 20 k a small lab can now do their own milling instead of outsourcing. But don't forget the medium and larger labs can benefit big time from this too. The UP3D recently opened a home office in California near Oradent. So does that mean the mill ships from California and the remote technical support is also in California? Yes, Barbara, you are correct. All right. Obviously, <laughs> as always, they are both in the United States in Southern California. All you got to do is call our friends over at Oradent. 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit their website at Oradent.com. We appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradent. Thank you. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. So we're excited to have on the podcast today a name that's kind of famous for framework partials, but I think there's a whole lot more behind this story. We welcome Tim Bertram to the program. How are you, sir? Excellent. Excellent. Appreciate the invite to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, we are excited to have you on. I saw you at CalLab. What was that, two years ago? Two years ago. That sounds right. Yes. Yeah, two years ago. You're on stage, and I remember you kind of blowing everybody away with what you're doing for frameworks. (laughs) <laughs> well, I might be over exaggerated, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, when I say everybody, I say me. Yeah. Because what I saw, let's see if I can summarize it. Basically, you were cutting frameworks out of sheets or blocks of metal. Is is that a good way to explain what you do? Um, no, that it's actually the exact <laughs> opposite. <laughs> Yay, I'm smart. <laughs> so yeah, let him explain it all in his terms. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Barbara. (laughs) What you're kind of prefacing there is milling, you know, so you're doing that subtractive technology where, you know, this is 3D printing. So it's additive where we're actually building up on this plate or block of metal, but we're using selective laser melting technology to basically be welding and print the partials. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So kind of like what the new technology is for coping crowns right now, the SLM building it up in metal but it's for partials correct awesome i want to get into that i truly do i want to nerd out on it with you yes it's definitely a good nerd topic so (laughs) nice but first i want to know how it all started because obviously when you opened in 1976 i think it wasn't all about laser centering partial correct absolutely not (laughs) (laughs) absolutely not and i can spend a fair amount of time on that depending on how far back we want to go all the way Uh, all the way way. okay so i'll give you the (laughs) i'll try to do the shorter version of the timeline here but we've been around since 1976 but i'll say the the history and the roots go back a little further Mm -hmm. so my grandfather started his own lab in 1951 wow in oakland california and that at that time was called precision chrome and my grandfather's name tom bertram Hmm. fast forward to 1976 when two of his sons moved to wisconsin and started their own lab bill and tom bertram along with their wives jody and margie bertram was that your dad that's my dad and my uncle okay Cool. Yes, yeah, sorry, I could clarify that. So they started that casting lab and it's and it's always been founded on the preface of being a chrome lab and a wholesale lab. So wanting to work with other labs directly is our goal. Oh, okay. We do work with some dentists directly, but not that much. Our goal is really we want to have that relationship with our customers that are lab customers. So anyways, that's the direction of that, how that's always played out. So your grandfather started it and then he got your father and his brother interested in it. And then obviously you came along. So were you a little lab rat? Were you always in lab when you were growing up like I was? <laughs> yes. Yes. I hear, I hear your stories when listening to your podcast <laughs> and it sounds so familiar, yeah. um, but, but to clarify you know, my grandfather, it was his own lab. He sold his lab to a company called Denticon. Mm-hmm. So Bertram Dental Lab and Precision Chrome were their own entities. But that knowledge and that training was passed along to Bill and Tom and other 
family members that were involved that actually still work for us. Like we have my uncle that was also involved way back at Precision Chrome, and he's still working at Bertram Dental Lab to this day. Wow. I love that. Yeah. You guys know I love that. That just makes me happy. It's such a family interest. There's a lot of family involvement there. So um, a lot of history, which is great. I love that. Me too. Mm. But to your point, yes, I was uh, definitely a lab rat. I started working in the lab at age 12. Mm. Yeah, labor laws. Labor, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> you didn't need a work permit if you were the owner's kid. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> you know, so I was in the the back room, as we called it, running our uh, polishing machines, these ginormous rock tumbling machines polishing frameworks wow so that's what i did in my summers and then strategically i think you know my dad had me moving from department to department every summer so i was getting exposed to everything Mm -hmm. did you get paid oh yeah awesome yep yep i don't know i don't remember what the rate was but i'm sure it was about a quarter an hour or something (laughs) yep so you got exposed to every single thing in the lab that's pretty smart of your dad Right. He's always been a pretty good strategic thinker. Yep. Fast forward to 2018 and Tom and Bill were looking to, you know, retire. And my cousin Joe and I purchased the business then in 2018. Okay. So it's two years. All right. Yeah. Two years. And there's been a a lot of activity since that point. Yeah. You must have exploded really quickly to be speaking at Cal Lab about everything that you were doing just just short two years after you bought the company that's pretty amazing yeah it was i i'm not gonna lie it was very uh humbling to get this invite from jerry ragel Mm -hmm. and it was one of those things where you know this is a great opportunity we were really on the cutting edge we had this slm printing that we started in production in-house in 2016 Mm -hmm. so we had you know at that point of calab that would be about two and a half years of production you know, day-to-day production under our belt. So I felt like we really had a good topic to talk about at that point. Do you like public speaking? Just curious. Yes and no. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's everybody's answer. Right. It's the anxiety building up to it. But once you do it and you're done with it, it's great. You know, you have a great feeling afterwards of accomplishment and you meet a lot of people that you wouldn't get exposed to otherwise and it pushes you. So that's good for growth. Yeah, you definitely get out of your comfort zone. You know, most dental technicians or a lot of us, you know, we're introverted and we like just, you know, going to the bench and focusing on our work and stepping out of the box and presenting everything that you do. I mean, that's uh, very nerve wracking. And I, I was there as well. It was amazing. Did you meet a lot of laboratories that have been using you since then? We did. And that took some time to develop those relationships, but we did definitely gain some customers from that Calab presentation. Wow. Yeah, that was really nice. So we've been attempting, I'll say, because it's taking a long time, but we are moving into a a new building end of December this year. Fantastic. Nice time to move. Yeah, Yeah, right? (laughs) Right. Nothing like adding a little bit of extra stress and hurdles here. (laughs) So talk about the evolution of the partial. I still have a guy here at our lab that's in his 70s. Right. Still hand waxing, still casting, still polishing. And he's bugging me about teaching it to someone that can digitally do it because, I mean, he knows he's done. And Mm -hmm. you took that step. You took it to the digital. Right. And to tell you the truth, we're still in transition where, in my opinion, I don't see casting ever going away. I still see there being a lot of applications where you're going to need it. Yeah. But for 95% of Chrome cases, there's no reason you can't print them. The biggest hurdle is the cost of the machine. Yeah. Which is where we want to work, continue to work with labs for allowing them to have whatever say or input and control they want to have over those CAD designs of their RPDs. And we can just print them if they want. And we've been doing that for a lot of customers that just want to get away from the casting. And and we work and help them learn some of the design techniques. We use 3Shape. I know some other Mm -hmm. people do other things with ExoCAD, but that's kind of what we're really versed in. Sure. Does the lab design their own cases and then send them to you? What's the process that one would go through? I'll try to explain the workflows that we have options for right now. Yeah. So we do a lot of casting still in-house. And like you're talking about, Elvis, the traditional wax by hand. We actually do more of that than printing right now. Hmm. Really? 
How many people do you have doing that? <laughs> Just waxing? Yeah. This is a estimate about 15. No wow. kidding. Wow. Yeah. Right. But our, we're limited by how much we can fit through our printers, mm. you know, our metal printers. So part of the reason we're moving into a new building to be able to add more printers and, and have enough power because these things are fairly big, fairly expensive. So we need to increase our capacity to be sure. able to, to do more of that. How many can you print a day out of one printer? Well, it depends on, you know, for some people, what model printer they're running. I mean, it's really not that different than, say, if you're running model printers as far as mm-hmm. capacity. But we do anywhere from 40 to 45 frames of print. Wow. How long does that print take? Our print time is 12 to 14 hours. Mm. Woo. Okay. That's a day. <laughs> yeah, but we've got it down. Our CAD team is amazing. We really got it down to a science where you know, we started by a certain time. It runs all night. If it stops, we get an email or a text, and we know what's going on. And we come in the morning, and it's ready to go. Mm, that's pretty cool. So go back to that workflow. We really didn't get into that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So we have a lot of lab customers that just, you know, they want to be hands-off. They don't have the technical ability or, or time to deal with doing the frame. So they just literally ship us a model. We do everything except set the teeth. You know, we design the framework, wax, cast, everything. (laughs) Then we have the workflow of same thing. Send us a stone model and we'll do the design. We'll scan it. We'll do the CAD work and we'll metal print it. That's Mm -hmm. all printed. And then we have the workflow of uploading through our website where you have labs that are designing their own frames. They upload their frame for us to print and we do that. And we give them options of having a no finish, just a sandblast finish frame or a pre-polished. So it's pretty close to being done or a fully finished frame. Wow. We're also getting iOS scans and model scans through our website as well. Very cool. So we'll CAD design off of the model scans or iOS scans. We seem to have the most success though. And we're working with labs that do have that person in house that like you're talking about Elvis, that you have this guy with the knowledge that can put a basic drawing down mm-hmm. on a model scan and will look at their pencil drawing and basically follow it. Mm-hmm. But then they don't have to deal with anything else. That's pretty awesome. So I've got a question. So obviously you're growing. So yes. what happened during COVID for you guys? How did you move through that whole thing? Did you furlough people? Did you just kind of keep a small crew on? What was your business like during that time? And now, how are you guys doing? Right. When it first started, we did have to furlough quite a few people, which was difficult. Yeah. Most of our salaried people did continue to work and they did an amazing job. They did whatever had to be done. People were shifting, you know, from departments and jobs that they never did just to do whatever came in the door. So we never really closed. It was whatever came in through the door, we still did. Yep. Some of those timelines were delayed. I think a lot of labs were somewhat understanding because they were all having the same situation. Mm -hmm. But then to your later question, as of right now, we're at full capacity. In fact, for approximately two months now, we've started a waiting list with new customers that we're, we can't take any more work right now until we get moved into this new facility and our production capacity can increase. So you're moving into a new building and investing in new machines? Yes, Wow. That's pretty spectacular. We were talking to well, people, I think Elvis and I, a couple of weeks ago on, you know, what, what does your business model look like? Are you investing? Are you doing anything? And most everybody we talk to is kind of just, you know, monitoring it, seeing what's happening. But it sounds like you guys are in a position where you're just investing. With the real estate, we were already committed before all yeah. of this. You know, we, there's no option. We have to get in and get operational. But with the machines, and maybe for some of your listeners, this is something that they might scratch their head on. If they're in a point of financial strength right now, if they're feeling confident, you know, their business is strong, a lot of these machine manufacturers, their sales are so down. Like this is a time to buy if you can. They're willing to deal. Do you have many different machines or do you just pretty much, are you using one, two, or do you use the same company? I mean, do you look at different machines that can do more capacity? How do you guys figure out what is going to work for your business? So 
that's my job is to really research as much as I can on these printers. And I have looked at everything huh. I possibly can, Yeah, you know, flown to other production facilities that aren't doing dental, but using this technology and looked at everything I can. But currently we only run one company's machine. Okay. I'm all about simplicity. If we have something that we can fully understand and you have all those learning curves figured out, you have your staff trained, it's so much easier to stay with the same thing if you can do it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you guys probably deal with that, I'm assuming, with mills. We don't really mill much, if anything, at this point in-house. We do have some things milled that we send out for uh, flexible RPDs, Mm -hmm. but that's it. So your customers are labs. So do you have any dentists? We do have some dentists, yes. So how does a dentist find out about you? Just from word of mouth (laughs) or sometimes like I'll say a lab closes up and they'll say, you know, what am I going to do with my frames? And they say, well, we were sending to so-and-so and And just naturally that happens sometimes. But obviously we're trying to avoid that relationship on some levels because we don't want to undercut our our lab customers. Mm -hmm. You know, these are their customers. So we want to be loyal to our labs. Yep. Yeah, you don't want a conflict there where you're moving in two directions. I really like the fact that you're, you're lab related only. I guess growing up, I always thought that was kind of normal. I thought that people in dental labs just made partials. Mm-hmm. And then obviously you figure that's different when you get older. And to me, I'm so impressed with these full service labs. Honestly, I don't know how they do it, especially with how much technology is constantly changing. You know, we're looking at a couple product lines right now for us where these full service labs are doing everything. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how. We don't know either. (laughs) (laughs) That's my thought. I don't know how we do it every day. You know, yeah, yeah, I don't either. I get the outsourcing trend because it's like, how can you justify spending so much on this machine that does one thing and this machine that does another? And you got to have enough volume to actually make any money. Yeah, it's tough. Right. And which is why I think we kind of have a good niche where like we want to be that resource for our customers that they can reduce some of that overhead and still have control over their designs if they want and be that resource that we can print their frames. Mm. Do you find any difference between the fits on the ones that you do um, traditionally versus the printed or the SLM? Sorry. Yes. Good question. We've had really good fits on the SLM frames, but I will admit There is a learning curve there. Mm -hmm. There are factors in that process that you need to know. It's not just you buy this machine and you hit play and you got your partials. Yeah. You know, there's heat treatment process. So once the print is done, they have to be heat treated properly to release any internal stresses that were built up while it was being printed and welded. Mm -hmm. And then very similar to when you're printing a model, there's support structures holding this part, well, if your support structure strategy isn't strong enough or in the right areas, you're going to have problems too. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely, I'll say a secret sauce there to make it all work. But once you have it dialed in, no flash and the fits are amazing. What are some other pros and cons to printing compared to traditional? Other than fit, I mean, strength, length of life, all that, is it still about the same? I'd say it's about the same. You know, people like to talk about metal, and that's one thing that there's controversy sometimes because not all SLM printing is the same, just like not all model printing is the same. There's different technologies, there's different resins. So I think maybe originally with some SLM printing, people's first exposure, I'm going to guess would be if they were getting like a coping printed. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So they're comparing that coping to milling. So there's probably pros and cons that they're seeing there. It's the same thing with printing RPDs in that the alloy that you're using is a factor. The heat treatment that you're using is a factor. The machine that you're using is a factor because the gas flow that is uh, protecting the weld is extremely important. So I'll just say not all SLM printing is the same. So there's all those factors that go into it. But when you have it right, you get it right. Is the machine you use, was it made for partials or was it like some sort of other industry specific machine? No, it it was not specific to partials, but it's definitely used in dental in lots of areas. Yeah. 
Interesting. We, at that point in time, 2016, from that machine manufacturer, were the first people to do RPDs with it. Yeah. Well, you keep referencing welding. What What are you welding? So when you're printing, you have this powder bed of alloy, and you have lasers melting, and that's welding okay. layer to layer. Okay. Wow. Now I have a picture of it. For every layer, a 30 micron a thirty micron layer, and just keep building okay. and welding on top of it. How long does that take? How long does it take to make a full partial that way? Well, I honestly, I've never printed just one on its plate all by itself. Like I said before, the full plate, 40 to 45 partials is 13 hours Damn. average. That's intense. Now, you say you design there, but a lot of people design their own. Do you know of a place where someone can learn RPD CAD CAM design? That's a good question. Honestly, I can't think of anybody offhand that's yeah. teaching that directly right now. We actually created a training room in our new facility where nice. long term, we have the idea of offering training on site and doing some classes to mm -hmm. uh, lab customers where they could send their tech and we could do on-site training with them hmm. is kind of the goal long-term there. Yeah. But our portal where files are uploaded, I've created some training videos that I'll post there to help people with kind of common problems. So I'm trying to build that library too as a resource for our customers. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's what a lot of labs struggle with. I mean, I know we do, is finding a resource to learn partial design. Sure. Well, let's get you guys set up, Elvis, in the uh, the customer portal, and you can just watch the videos. And we also have our DME parts library that mm -hmm. you know we provide. If people want to use the class patterns that we've developed, we create that library and we make that available as well. So that just goes into three shapes. So all the clasps are like an option. Yes, exactly. You oh. just import all the clasps that we've created, and you know all the thicknesses are what you need at a minimum. And obviously, this is what we're using day to day. So we know printing wise is going to be perfect. So we have that whole library available. <laughs> I didn't even realize you could do that. I mean, I know of the uh, library for implants and stuff. I didn't know they had it for clasps. That's pretty cool. Yep. Major connectors, bars, plates, everything. Nice. And you provide that to the people at no charge? Yep. Wow. Probably makes everybody better if they are learning to do it. I mean, it's... it's right. Good. Exactly. It just makes it easier for anybody. And when obviously we want to work with them, so we're trying to make them as successful as possible. Yeah. The difference is, so is it mostly chrome cobalt that you're using on your um, frames? Yes, that we print exclusively in that. So when you cast and you print, what's the, I, I don't know if you'll know the answer, but what's the cost difference between the two metals, one being a powder and one being a, a, a metal? That's a tough question because it really depends on where you're, you know, where you're sourcing it from. Powdered alloy is more expensive than your ingot form. Okay. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So there's more processing. It's, it's a real science when you get into the specs on powder. So when we purchase powder, we're specifying the particle sizes even. Like it has to fall between X amount of microns and X amount of microns hmm. for us to have and use this powder. And the way they make the powder is amazing. It's gas atomization. That sounds like a made up word. I did. I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I just made it up. Wow. <laughs> so you've got to weigh the powder and weigh the print to figure out how much for each of them? No, you just load the machine with the powder. Okay. That's not an issue. You're just specifying when you purchase a powder what particle size that you want because you could have really, really fine, let's say, under 20 micron powder. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you want powder that's between 20 and 45 microns. Hmm. And that's what you're looking at when you're trying to, you know, spec your alloy. And how the heck do you figure that out? A lot of R&D. Like when you're looking at your print, how do you know what size particles you need where? It comes down to the machine that you're using, what size particles that it's going to need to work properly. Oh, 
Got but it. then also surface finish. So a surface finish of your partial or your parts, obviously the finer you can go with your particle size, generally speaking, your your surface finner finish is going to be smoother and, and better. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Forgive me for my cluelessness, but I'm, I'm trying to like figure it out in my head, you know, how it all works. But that makes a lot of sense. So the, the smaller the particle, the easier the finish. Right. And the other big factor is the gas flow. So the gas flow of your machine, obviously you want a good gas flow that's keeping your part clean and your chamber clean that where you're printing. Hmm. Which gas do you use? Cast. The gas is Oh, named gas. Cast? Yeah, sorry. Oh. I thought you said cast. <laughs> <laughs> we use nitrogen. Nitrogen, there you go. Yeah, you can use argon too, but nitrogen's just a little more economical. And it doesn't really okay. matter. Um, your result is the same. Hmm. You know, everything's rapidly advancing. Do the actual designs themselves change at all? in this part of our laboratory industry? I mean, or do you have just basic designs or is anything changing relative to that? When you're talking about designs, you mean CAD designs or just partial designs in general? Yeah, the partial design themselves. Do you have basic designs? Does anybody ever throw a loop in the kind of design that they're looking for? Or does that Oh, sure. We we get lots of unique requests from labs and doctors on what they're specifying. Hmm. And then you get some labs which just say you know do your best design which is honestly the best because that's what we really are good at yeah and that's what we get 90 percent of the time on the script when they want a partial upper yeah great (laughs) no specific instructions right which i'm not i'm not gonna lie that's that works good for us yeah so what about all the unique things that partials have been known for? Attachments, swing locks, metal dummies, all wow. these crazy things. listen to you. I know. Wow, it's yeah, impressive. impressive. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Can you handle all that? Yes, yes. But all those things you referenced except attachments, we cast. So if it's a, a swing lock, we'll cast it. Uh, most of our all cast, so backings and facings and dummies – yeah. We'll, we'll probably cast. Uh, we do metal print the files if we get them in, and we've had pretty good success with those. They just add a lot of print time, mm-hmm. which is okay, but that's what we've had to adjust to, to learn how much more time, say, a full all-cast case is going to take. Sure. But you handle all the ERA attachments, various studs. Yep. All that? Yep. What is it? The DE hinges? De, they call yep, it? DE hinges. Yeah. We're still uh, casting those. Like you said, swing locks. I'd like to learn and see somebody eventually do a CAD design of a swing lock. And we've talked yeah. about that internally. We haven't done it yet. If we could get a CAD design on a, uh, a hinge, would be great. Hmm. Do you do a lot of those? I mean, do you see a fair amount? Well, you know, it's a couple a month. No kid, that's a lot to me. I mean, I see them maybe twice a year. <laughs> yeah, but you know, we're that's all we're doing. So true, true. Do you guys do any other material other than metal? Are you doing any of the clear materials? Yes, that's a great question. We more recently, I'll say in the last three years, felt a need to get involved with some of those other materials, and we've been doing it. I'll say analog and digital again. So analog. When we get a, a flexible partial in, the accounts we work with have already done their setup mm-hmm. on it. So we're just waxing and injecting that material. Hmm. So we'll do uh, VisiClear and Pink. Yeah. Duraflex. Yeah. Duraflex, yeah. Duraflex, yeah. Are you seeing that market grow? We are. Yeah. We are. But we're also doing a lot of flexibles where we're doing the CAD design and then milling them. Hmm. Cool. You're milling flexibles? We're milling flexibles where we do the CAD work, when we put mesh work where the teeth are missing, and then when the customer gets it back, then they're doing their acrylic setup still, but it's a flexible frame. So we kind of have both versions going right now. Interesting. So how do they uh, hear the teeth to the flexible frame? With acrylic? Does that? Yeah, with acrylic. Oh, really? I didn't think those two were compatible to work like that. Yep. Apparently, it's been very successful with a lot of the labs that we've been working with keep requesting the same thing. Yeah, well, that's a good sign. Yeah. If they keep coming back asking for more, you're doing something right. Right, (laughs) right. (laughs) Yeah, and there's some really good materials out there. The Acetals and Biosense. I don't know if you guys ever have used that. It's like a really, really clear 
material. I, I've had good success with that. And what are those for? For clasp or the whole thing? The whole thing. The whole frame. In clear. Yep. In clear. I've never done a clear partial in our lab. You see that being used a lot? It makes sense. Why <laughs> I see I another did. pink. Yeah. I think it's honestly like a third, a third, a third. It's almost clear, tooth shade, and pink. Yeah. Or tissue, I should say. It makes sense to be clear. I mean, we always have trouble, not trouble, but we always have to match gingiva shades and whatnot. But if you make it clear, you don't have to worry about it. Blends right in. Right. Yeah, it makes right. sense to me. I noticed on your website that you guys do surgical guides, too. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. We didn't touch on that. That's kind of yeah. something with the metal printing that just we naturally grew into and continue to do more of where we're getting these STL files of... We're not designing them, but we're getting them to print and manufacture. So we've been doing the guides, and mm-hmm. we've been doing these full arch, I'll call them thimble cases. Yeah. And some ortho cases lately that we've been getting requests for metal printing. Yeah. What are people designing them on? What programs? Uh, ExoCAD, 3Shape. Oh, really? Mainly. Okay. Yeah. So they're doing like full arch guide design. Mm-hmm. And then instead of printing them and having a resin-based guide, you can do them out of metal, which is substantially sturdier and, and better, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. Awesome. We've had some really great partners to work with in the guides area because I think when they were getting into it, they were learning and we kind of grew together and developed a guide together. Mm-hmm. And we continue to work with them, I would like to say, but we're under nda <laughs> so can't say who we're working with there yeah that makes sense wow wink wink i get it the ortho thing is really interesting as well because i actually had a local ortho doc approach me and ask if we did this metal printing i was like yeah we do and mm-hmm. so what we've been doing is these custom ortho bands hmm. where the patients can avoid an additional appointment and we just print a custom ortho band that normally would have been like a like a stock I'll say band yeah and they make the expanders the paddle expanders with the bands so it's like a lingual arch or it's, I don't know much it's about it's like ortho. a band that goes just around one single molar and then a lingual uh, a plate that kind of goes on to the by and the second molar i see so instead of using the preformed tooth bands, which is always not perfect, right? You guys can print one that's custom made, right? Oh, exactly. that's cool. So then, yeah. what happens is because normally with those prefab bands, they would have to place separators between the teeth mm-hmm. in order to get that band in. Yeah. With a custom printed band, they don't have to do the separator appointment, and they just cement the band in, and then they can do uh, weld the screw in the pallet for the expander. Very cool. Yeah, it's been going really well. And oddly enough, we never bought the three-shape ortho module. Mm -hmm. We actually were using the RPD module to do these bands. (laughs) Really? Right. So we get an iOS scan from this local ortho doc and do it right off of the RPD module. Wow. Out of an intraoral scan. Right. We all know how hard it is to do any ortho off of an intraoral scan. Right. These are pretty small yeah. bands, so they're really not too difficult to do on the design side. Yeah. Very cool. So what's next for you guys? Are you um I obviously you guys are gonna move your building and you have that transition, but are you looking at anything else like material wise that you wanna move into? No, honestly right now I think we have enough on our plate with uh <laughs> with the move and trying to expand our production capacity. And doing the flexibles and doing the chrome and doing the guides and some of the ortho. So I really think we're yeah. we're set up for the next couple of years Come for, on, so, Tim. for some growth. Get a, get a few more products in there. Come on. You can do it. You uh, got some time, right? Right? Do you market directly to dental labs or is it just mostly word of mouth? It's been mostly word of mouth. We've been uh, trying to do a little more promotions you know a little bit more here and there but we don't want to ramp that up until we know we have the full capacity ready yeah yeah you guys offer two wonderful products that i hear constantly from labs that are hard to do or hard to manage and those are flexibles and frameworks you know we have the best 
I'm obviously biased, the best design <laughs> department. I'm not talking CAD design. I'm talking people that are literally by hand drawing on a stone model, people that have 40 years experience. Well, where'd you find all these people in what, Wisconsin? Yes. Yes. No. They, all these people are trained, you know, in house. These aren't people that we've hired with experience. They've started, some of them have started, you know, in the seventies. Wow. Wow. They must all be in Wisconsin because I we can't find anybody down here in Florida. Honestly, <laughs> I, it's it's super sad because they're just but but like you said, you're you're training them. So so how do you train new employees when they come in on the do job? You guys have a whole program on the job. On yeah. the job, yeah. Just kind of get next to the person that's going to be mentoring you and working with them day to day. That's how we all do it. Unfortunately, you know, I wish there were better ways, but. That's, right. That's well, with it. this new building and this uh, training room, which could be open to other labs, but also internally, we're looking to develop at least some basic training, hopefully, where we can take it off the bench a little bit and then give some formal training and use that space. Yeah. I think it would go over well in the industry if you had good three shape, maybe eventually ExoCAD training for labs to be able to send you the stuff pre design like because like i mentioned earlier uh, i got a 70 some odd year old guy that's just rocking him out he loves doing it but he's not going to be doing it forever right and uh i'm gonna need you Tim. <laughs> i know it it's just that's what's next see that's what inadvertently we answered that question <laughs> yep yeah but a part of me still wants to keep the design here right i get that so that's the ideal situation where if you can find that the next person that wants to be on the computer and you can still have control over that design and those details and then just you know send the file off for manufacturing so you don't have to deal with that side of it yeah yeah i have no desire for a ginormous slm machine somewhere <laughs> here now. yeah i'm good I'm but you good. can you print can... lots of fun trinkets i bet I bet oh, you yeah. have wonderful Christmas gifts for everyone. Wonderful. We did a Baby Yoda a few months back. That was there pretty fun. Out of metal. Yes. Wow. Nice. Do you guys give tours? Do you have people that come in and take a look at your facility? Not currently, but once we move, you know, we have a little more space. Hang on. Yeah. We're almost tripling our space. So this is going to be so nice to have a little more room to move around and grow. That's insane. So what are you adding? Another machine? Two machines? How much? That That's a secret knowledge, Elvis. Oh. Secret production knowledge. So 15 of them, I get 15, it. 15, there you go. <laughs> wow. You go big. <laughs> yep. Well, I think it's amazing what you've built. It's cool to hear your grandfather was doing partials and then your dad and now you. What about the next generation? You got kids? <laughs> I've got kids, but they're pretty young. Yeah. <laughs> my oldest is six and uh, she says she's going to be a dentist and uh, my son's four Aww. and he has interest. He likes to play on the computer right now. Yeah. I don't know. Well, by 12, they'll be full time, right? Right. I full mean, time. That's how it goes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> no, I, I'm a big believer in letting them do whatever they want. And if they have interest, yeah. great. If they don't, that's fine, too. Sure. Aww. They'll get in there. You know they will. Well, if they have interest, great. You know, honestly, there was a point in my career after 10 years of designing, I had second thoughts. I thought about moving on because it was at a point where you know, I went to Nobilium or CMP mm -hmm. Industries in 2008. And that's right when Sensible came out. I don't know if you guys remember that. I don't. No. So Sensible was pre three shape which eventually developed my understanding is into exocad oh okay and they had like a haptic device they called it which you didn't use a mouse to design it was like this free floating pen oh okay so i was yeah. you know really excited to learn this cad design but we didn't have success with the actual casting and printing so we could you know print the partial out of resin but the fits, we could not achieve the fit to the model that were consistent. Mm -hmm. So what happened is it sat kind of stagnant for four years until SLM technology came out. And then we started researching that more and more and more. And then it went that way. But there was a point where I just felt like if this isn't going to go digital, I don't know that I have enough interest to continue. Yeah. Hmm. What came out to keep you around? I mean, what, what was the technology that sold you? Well, that's the SLM. 
printing. The SLM printing, yeah. Right, right. That was hook, line, and sinker. Everything I knew where this company was going to go to continue to, to be able to grow and, in my opinion, make it easier to recruit people that have an interest in manufacturing and 3D printing. Yeah. Do you guys feel like that with your labs? I don't know how much digital versus analog you do, but do you find recruiting is easier with younger people if they're going into digital? I do. Yeah. 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 I mean, really, the way our lab's situated, I mean, everyone that does analog, they've been doing it for 40 plus years. Yeah. So as they retire in the next, you know, I'll say 10 to 20 years, because like I say, I got people almost 80 here. I don't think replacing them is even an option. I think you have to bring in the younger people for the digital. Right. But it's so much nicer when you have, in my opinion, somebody who has that analog background that can do digital because yeah. then they, they really understand both versions and what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. My goal is to bring them in while they're still here doing the analog so they can teach them and work on it together. Like I said, that 70-some-odd-year-old framework guy is hitting me about learning digital so he can teach it to somebody else. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, he's excited about it because he knows that it's the way to go. Right. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to have to get this in the next year, this training option open for you guys and send them up here. For sure. Let's get through this whole uh, little pandemic thing we're going on. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I bet you you saw quite a dip in cases. I don't know how to answer that. We we kind of did, yes. We yeah. did we did when there was the mandatory shutdown in March. But sure. what we noticed was before it became public knowledge that this was a coronavirus, we were getting really busy, like really <laughs> busy. Yep. So what we eventually figured out was people that were outsourcing overseas, that connection was being shut down. Yeah. And mm-hmm. now they were looking for other options. Yeah. So we we were picking up that work before COVID, then slowed down once the shutdown was in effect. Yeah. And now after, again, I shouldn't say after, it's not over, but at this point, we're very high for production. Nice. Everybody is, it seems like. There's not very many I hear that are slow. Right. You think that's a backlog of work that (sighs) that's, that's coming from? I think it's a combination of that and then just, yeah, the backlog and then the need of people wanting to get work done. I mean, I, I don't know, honestly. I think because the dentist got shocked when all their work got held up when they shut uh, China down. They never want to experience that again. So I think a lot more work's coming back into the States and, and thank God for it. That's really what I think, but could be wrong. Yeah. Do you feel like they're out of this whole situation? There might be some positivity that yep. maybe a little more transparency between yep. the dentist and the patient of where is this work coming from? Yeah. Bingo. That's Bingo. what I'm hoping. That's what we're hoping too. Because I don't feel like that's really that well disclosed yeah. in an in industry. For sure. We don't outsource anything outside the U.S. Even your material, your metal and everything? No, I'm not concluding the material. Yeah, it's hard to. I'm talking the actual production of the frames. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. The the metal actually comes from Europe, though. Yeah, especially the design. I mean, that's the new thing for people to outsource. And I honestly don't think that's okay either. You know, I want to keep it all here. I, I get mixed feelings on that as well. But we, again, same thing. The design is not outsourced. That's important, and I think a lot of people need to understand that because a lot of places, even though they say manufactured in the U.S., they're not designed in the U.S. Yep. We need to keep these people employed and the industry strong. Right, and well, when it comes to RPDs, there's there's so much design knowledge that can be lost if you're just sending a scan. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. It takes a lot of talent. I mean, anybody can look at this thing and say, class, clasp, and arrest. Right. But, eh, that's not going to work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it, yeah, we do a lot of phone calls. I know I shouldn't say we, our lab manager, Jeff Burton, he's been with our lab for a long time. A lot of people in the industry have made contact with him, and he's a yeah. really good resource and has a lot of contacts where our accounts, I should say, where he's discussing design options with them every day. Hmm. Just curious how many cases you reject because teeth are not ready, scans are not right, 
you know, just various reasons. Do you reject a lot? That's hard to say, but, you know, probably I'm going to say around 5%. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of calls that we question, is this impression accurate? Do you really want to proceed yeah. with this? And it's yep. do your best. As everybody knows that line, do yep, your best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's the charge when it comes back. <laughs> You own it. Yeah, exactly. Full charge if if you want to proceed. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, we get a lot of intraoral scans where they want us to do it, and they just don't capture enough data. And I can't tell you how many times we're like, we don't have everything that we need. It's not a crown scan. We need more. What do you do with that, Elvis? So when we get iOS scans, do you ever have, I'll say, like glitches where you can't get the model to make a watertight model and make a base if you need a model our biggest issue is they just don't get they want us to make a partial that goes back distally and they just don't go past that tooth oh they're like it's just not there okay and i'm like yeah i know the lady or whoever <laughs> scans every day is used to doing just the teeth we're needing more information than just the teeth you know what i mean right yep that's our biggest issue it's just like they don't get out of the scan only teeth okay. phase. Yeah. We don't really run into that too bad. I've had more issues with just the scans coming in and not being able to get the model to be watertight and What do you mean by watertight? Meaning like you know how your iOS scan you just have one surface. Now yeah. you need to put a base on it with without yeah. any holes in the actual STL file. Okay, yeah. So if it's not watertight, you can't technically have a model that's printable so that's done in model builder right, right? but I mean, there are times yeah. where it will on our uh, we've had experience where it can't complete it like it's trying to complete the base in model builder yeah. but there's an error interesting so people yeah, that are like know. really into it they would say there's a, like an inverted triangle in the stl yeah something that's causing a problem yeah well you know what do i do well. I, I call put it on them you know Let's do. Let's try it again. It's it's not fun, but okay. So that's I that's mean, what you guys do. Because at this point, we're not getting a ton, but we're trying to work through that. Like, how do we handle these? Um, where yeah. we'll bring them into another expensive software that we use for um, actually printing the partials, and we'll try to fix the file for them, yeah. and then re re import it into Three Shape to then get Model Builder to finish the rest. Yeah, I'm sure there are some super CAD people out there, even some listening, that can probably tell you with, what is it, mix mesh oh, yeah. and Blender. I'm sure they can they can figure this out. I personally have no idea. Yeah, we've used Mesh Mixer and then the Inspect tool, and you see where all the holes are and auto-fix yeah. it and, and things like that. It just seems time-consuming that – what point do you draw the line of saying we need to start over or we're altering their file too much? Yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. And then if you don't teach them and they don't go back to do it, you're going to get the exact same thing next time and next time and next time. Right, and right. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's just part of it. If you got to make sure you have the right data before you get started. Right. Well, that's awesome, Tim. We appreciate you coming on the podcast. I love what you're doing. I think it's needed in our industry. Like I said, as soon as I need your assistance, I'm calling. Sounds good. <laughs> I don't know about you, Barbara, but I'm available if you need any help. Heck yeah. We appreciate it, sir. Yeah, you guys too appreciate it for the opportunity here. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Okay. We'll talk to you. Awesome. And uh, when you get that training center open, uh, let us know. Sounds good. I'll send half my staff there. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Tim. Appreciate it. Yep. Talk to you guys later. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Bye. Whitmix is pleased to add the Vericast OS, a burnout pattern print resin, to Whitmix's growing Veribrand resin offering. Vericast OS works with LCD and DLP printers in both 385 and 405 nanometer wavelengths. It prints accurate and detailed crowns, bridges, substructures, and RPD frameworks. It's durable and leaves no ash or residue. Since it burns out cleanly, Veracast OS is ideal for investment casting and ceramic pressing. For optimal results, we recommend the Whitmix Resin Vest, which is a phosphate investment made specifically for burning out printed or milled resin patterns. Visit Whitmix.com to learn more about the Veracast OS or any of Whitmix's other 3D print resins. A huge thanks to Tim for coming on our podcast to tell us about how you print metal frames and assist labs to be more successful. 
I'll tell you what, it's going to be nice to have a place so that we can get technicians trained for the dying art of partial design. If you need any of their services, just head over to BertramDental.com. Yeah, I actually sent over a couple flexibles since we talked to him and got them back. And I tell you, they are beautiful and ready to go right out. Nice. Yeah, we've been struggling in our lab with the personnel and keeping the equipment working. It's super nice to have an option out there that only does it for other labs. Well, thanks, Tim. You're amazing. Awesome stuff. Yep. Well, don't forget, get in touch with us. Let's make this year the best year yet. Happy New Year. All right, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. You're on point today. (laughs) That was good. Thanks.